Hello everybody and welcome to another episode in the Head Acoustics webinar series. My name is Jacob Sondergaard and I am your host today. Today's topic is all about smart speakers and smart home testing. As I am sure you are aware, this is a domain and an industry that's experienced a lot of growth and a lot of revolutionary products have entered the market space in part because of your work. So for those reasons, uh, that we have put together something that we call HQS Smart Home, the Head Quality Standard Smart Home, as well as this slide deck that runs through that, talks about some of the key parameters. The webinar today will go through a little bit more about our perspective on smart home and smart speaker testing. And I'll use those two terms interchangeably, smart speaker and smart home testing. But then we'll dive in and talk about some of the single talker test scenarios that we have included in our test suite. We'll talk about some of the key conversational tests, and then we'll dive into the multi-talker scenarios, because there are a few very interesting test setups that we need to cover there. At the end, we'll just mention a few words about why HQS Smart Home could be a valuable addition to your test uh, portfolio. And then we'll put a nice big bow on it, wrap it up, and go home. So with that out of the way, let's first talk about the idea of a smart speaker or a smart home device. The whole point of these devices is to be very close to the end user. It could be in the form of a standalone product, like a smart speaker, or it could actually be integrated into general appliances in the home. But it is a way for somebody in an office or home environment to be able to not only do human to machine communication, so asking the big FFT in the sky to perform certain commands like change the lighting or set an alarm or a timer or schedule some things. That's one aspect that we have identified as a key feature of smart speakers and one aspect that we need to test. That's what we call the speech recognition testing in the top right. Another thing is some of these devices, typically the smart speaker devices specifically, have the ability to be used for audio playback and that is a big selling point and a big feature and a big use case for these types of products. That's something that we have addressed as well. We actually had a webinar not too long ago on the HQS audio test suite, which covered that specific aspect. And today's webinar will be focused on the communication element of these smart speakers, because a lot of them also allow for you to open up a communication protocol, typically using voice over IP, to communicate with another human, so human-to-human -human communication. And one of the common denominators uh, between those three elements is that top left icon, the room noise and the room acoustic simulation. We won't be touching too much on that today, but as I'm sure you know, no house is completely anechoic and noise-free. Each room in a house also differs in terms of the reverberation time and clarity and the ratio between the direct and the reverberant energy and so on and so forth. So a lot of the test cases, not just for communication that we'll cover today, but even audio and speech recognition, there is an element of room noise and room acoustic simulation that we actually should take into account and be that common denominator across all test platforms. So with that out of the way, let's start by painting a picture in the form of a block diagram. This setup will act as the foundation for what we're doing here the next 40 odd minutes. It will consist of a PC running Aqua and then a lab core or a bunch of MFEs the whole point is for the lab core to connect to the device under test, and that could be via USB, I2S, VoIP, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, it doesn't really matter to us. You just need a way to connect to the device and establish a call, which means sometimes we have to enlist the services of a server somewhere. 
And then of course we have the lab core interacting with a head and torso simulator which represents us in the sound field. And that head and torso will be interacting with the device acoustically both in the send and the receive direction. So with these pieces we can actually get started and talk about some of the testing. Now when we sat down and we evaluated everything that we had learned about smart speakers we realized that there's actually a fair amount of inspiration that we can draw from some established standards um, in the international community. And so especially Etsy and ITU have some really good standards that have in part been used to form the foundations of HQS Smart Home. So if you're not familiar with these standards, by all means write them down and then go look them up because they are all free to download. The Etsy standards are all about the quality tests of hands-free slash conferencing terminals in different bandwidths. And then ITUT P340, I know that's been around for a long time, but there's been some amendments recently that make it even more applicable to what we are doing with uh, smart home and smart speaker devices. So I highly encourage you to go and look these up and download the latest iterations. Now let's get to the fun part. Let's start with the key single talker test. So what I mean by a key single talker test is we have one near end talker represented by a head and torso and we have one far end talker represented by the aqua system. And these following test cases, they all have single direction measurements. So it's either purely in the send direction with the hats talking and the device sending a signal to Aqua, or it's purely in the receive direction. So the device receiving a signal from Aqua and then presenting that to the head and torso acoustically. So if you look at the screenshot on the right hand side, which is a quick snapshot overview of the HQS Smart Home database, you'll also see that we of course include things like echo and double talk those are what I would term conversational tests. So they're not included on our list here. In any case, when you look over it, you'll of course see things like delays and loudness rating, frequency response, speech quality distortion. These are all very typical, very common um, measurements that I'm sure you're familiar with. But I've plucked out three different test cases that I would like to discuss today because I think they are a little bit unique and a little bit interesting, goes beyond the typical stuff. So we'll talk about delay variation or what we call clock drift. We'll also talk about uh, muted microphone behavior. And then we'll talk about speech quality in the receive direction with network impairments. So let's start with the delay variation, sometimes known as clock drift. So the whole idea here is that we want to make sure that the test equipment, so the Aqua system and the lab core, is synchronized with your device under test, so the smart speaker or the smart home product. It is important that we are synchronized because we have a lot of test cases that depend on accurate time alignment. Now, the reason why we test for this in these types of products is because while your test equipment might be using the highest possible grade components and materials, smart speakers don't necessarily use the same type of components. So for instance, the quartz crystal found as the clock in many of these types of devices may be rated at, let's say 48K sampling, but truly is not exactly at 48K. And so what could happen over time is if we're off by a few parts per million or many parts per million, in the sampling of the device relative to your test system is that we start to drift apart. First, it's one packet length, then it's multiple packet lengths, and we end up not having proper time alignment and basically being unable to trust our data later on. So the measurement process that we do is we start by resetting the clock pitch of the lab core to zero parts per million. So typically we'll sample at 48K and we'll set that to 48K.000, just exactly 48K. And then we inject a very long, so 160 seconds of CSS bursts. And we measure the 
clock drift using the delay versus time analysis. So we can look over the 160 seconds and start to track any drifting um, or delay variations in the device relative to your test system. Once the 160 seconds um, test has been completed, we can then readjust the clock pitch of your lab core. So let's say we need to add 50 parts per million. So it's something like 48K and a couple of Hertz to get proper time alignment. We actually do the test again, just to make sure that we're within plus minus one part per million. And therefore, if you have the intention of doing four hours, eight hours, 12 hours worth of testing, let's say you're doing overnight or over the weekend even, then you have the utmost confidence that once you establish that call and you guys are synchronized, you and the device, then the data that you get will be uh, trustworthy and accurate based on the synchronization at least. So for those of you that are approaching this type of testing from the mobile phone industry, you might be aware that 3GPP does something similar for mobile phones. And that is in part because mobile phones you know, as you can imagine, these are battery operated, portable mobile devices, price sensitive, somewhat. And they, again, don't necessarily have the same type of high quality uh, clock components. So the mobile phone industry has been doing this for a little while. And this is something that we see as being important for this type of testing as well, which is why we have included it in the HQS Smart Home database. Now let's talk about muted microphone behavior. Obviously, our goal here is to check whether the mute button works. And the reason why that's important is if you have a customer that wants to mute themselves, they need to have confidence that the mute button actually works and they are not transmitting any private slash confidential information on the phone call when they have hit the mute button. And actually, this test, the muted microphone behavior test, is actually a twofold test. Because one thing is we're looking to see whether the mute button works. And if you look at the top right, you'll see that we inject a rather short stimulus, just a couple seconds. And with the mute button on, we just want to measure, are you basically transmitting silence? There should be no speech here. Uh, so we put a threshold of minus 80 dBmO and see if the device adheres to that. The second part of the muted microphone behavior is a little more sophisticated. So if you refer to the bottom right chart, you'll see that we use a slightly longer test stimulus. We inject six utterances. And now we want you to toggle the mute button off and on, off and on. So you start the test with the mute button on. Then after the first utterance has been spoken by the head and torso, we want you to very quickly unmute yourself and then mute yourself again before the second utterance shows up. And then we measure the level versus time of the sent signal by the device. So what the second graph here shows is three of the six utterances. So we're just doing this to illustrate what a typical speech stimulus would look like. What you really should be doing is have the mute button on and then after the first utterance, so about four seconds in, we want you to unmute and then mute yourself by the time the second utterance comes along. Then what we are checking for here is the physical act of pushing the mute button, the click click or boop boop or whatever noise it makes doesn't actually gets transmitted to the far end. And we put a threshold of that uh, of minus 57 dBmO. Now let's look at the speech quality in the receive direction using network impairments. So what we're doing here is we're putting the device into a situation where the communication network is non-ideal and we check to see the resulting speech quality in non-ideal conditions. So what we're doing here is we're actually checking the packet loss concealment algorithms and the jitter buffer management algorithms on board the device to see if they are present, they are active, and they are effective. Obviously, this is hugely important because very rarely do we have perfect internet or network conditions. So the device has to handle if certain packets don't show up in the right order or if some of them are missing entirely. 
So without going into too much detail about packet uh, switched calls versus circuit switch calls, we just have to realize that for packet switch calls and voice over IP, once the packets are encoded by one of the device it, devices, it gets tagged with an address and then just shotgun sprayed into the network until those packets get assembled, hopefully, at the far end, and then it's up to the jitter buffer management algorithms and packet loss concealment algorithms to make sure that these packets, despite their varying paths across the network, get assembled in the right order and presented to the user in the right order. So the measurement process that we do here is first we take a baseline measurement in a quiet environment with ideal speech and analyze using Polka. So that is the ITUTP863 metric for speech quality. And we analyze the MOS scores. We'll break that down. For instance, you'll see condition one is the clean condition. And we'll have every eight second chunk of audio. So that's two utterances. We'll give you a score and an average score for that. Now we repeat the measurement, but we start to dial in some network impairments. We start off soft, so you'll see condition two is 0% packet loss, but 20 milliseconds of jitter. And then we start to crank things up from there. But you can see even for this exemplary device, condition two, immediately you take a hit on the speech quality. And remember, nothing else has changed in the room. There's no added background noise. There's no added reverberation. This is just the effect of a poor network on this device. So clearly, seeing a drop of 0.6 MOS points for just 20 milliseconds of jitter is pretty severe and something that needs to be addressed on this particular device. And you can see when you step it up to condition 5, the worst case scenario, clearly, clearly the Polka scores drop and is something that should be addressed. Now, 3% packet loss is a little bit on the high side, but it's not atypical for a voice over IP network. So the test cases do make sense in terms of real world network conditions. Let's switch, switch gears and look at the conversational tests. So once again, I have a screenshot from Aqua where you can see some of the echo test and the double talk test. What I would like to address in this webinar are the perceptual echo assessment test. That's what we call eQuest. We'll talk about the spectral echo attenuation because it's A, pretty neat test, and B, we use it a fair bit. And then we'll talk about double talk performance in the sending direction. So the first one, perceptual echo assessment. This is eQuest. This is a MOS metric that evaluates the uh, perception of echo. So the echo signal gets fed through a hearing model and we basically try to give you a single quality indicator for that echo signal for these test conditions. So eQuest is very appropriate for not only hands-free devices, but also for voice over IP devices, as well as extended bandwidths, because for those three use cases, hands-free, voice over IP, and extended bandwidths, we typically have much longer delays. And as I'm sure you know, delays are one of the, or is one of the key uh, contributors to reduced echo cancer performance or poor conversational quality. And so eQuest is very applicable for this scenario of smart speaker and smart home devices. The measurement process for eQuest is relatively straightforward. We will, much like TCLW, present a speech signal to the device. But rather than just looking at the absolute loss, we'll then take the signal, the returned echo signal, and feed that through the eQuest algorithm. Now, sometimes the eQuest test will include some uplink speech interspersed between the downlink utterances just to make sure that our voice path is activated. But the test and the analysis is the same. So in our implementation here of HQS Smart Home, we use this for all volume settings as well as both the static 
and the variable acoustic echo path tests. So a quick note about those. Typically, what we do for static tests is we just put the product in the ideal location in front of the head and torso, and then we test the echo performance. Signal gets received by the device, plays it out into the room, and we see what comes back up from the device. Hopefully, nothing. The variable acoustic test, we actually put a large reflecting surface into the room near the device, and we rotate it to make sure that the device is now seeing all kinds of different echo artifacts and it has to deal with those. So some example data from an EQuest test would give us for each four second chunk of audio a overall MOS score, delays, echo level values. We also give you the relative approach numbers and the max correlation. So it's a lot more sophisticated than just looking at these these numbers and for instance looking at the echo level and saying oh high echo low moss yeah that's generally true but there's also other elements to it than that so it's a pretty sophisticated moss metric so let's look at the spectral echo attenuation because here we are now looking at a test that is very suitable for developers and engineers to use as a diagnostic tool. So where TCLW and EQuest just give you that one overall number, either from a mathematical perspective or a subjective perspective, either number don't tell you why the device is performing well or not so well. And one of the things that the spectral, spectral echo attenuation, attenuation test can do is to reveal if there are any uh, spectral components or echo artifacts in, in the frequency domain. So for the single talk scenario, the measurement process is similar to TCLW and EQuest, but when we analyze the echo return signal, we're now looking at it from a spectral perspective. And it'll give you clues as to where you have to tighten up the echo cancer performance low frequency, mid-range, high frequency. For double talk test, we use the very special mosquito buzz test stimulus. So that's an AM FM modulated signal. That sounds an awful lot like angry mosquitoes. But if you refer to the top right, you'll see an illustration of that signal. You'll see that in red, we have the downlink signal that the device receives. So it's just mosquito buzz the entire time. And then for a subset of that, we have the hats chiming in with its own mosquito buzz. And when we look at the spectrum of that signal, you'll notice that the green signal from the hat's mouth does not overlap and contain exactly the same frequencies as the mosquito buzz being presented to the device. So what that means is during double talk, when both parties are buzzing along, we can monitor the scent signal and hopefully clearly see the frequencies by the hats' mouth, but also analyze whether we have any echo signal returned for the frequencies shown in red. That would be the ones that the device is playing out that we don't want returned. Once we've made that analysis to see if there are any echo components, then we can use a table from ITUT P340 to let us know whether the device is what we would call a type one device or a full duplex. That is a device that has more than 27 dB of attenuation on that echo signal for each frequency band. And then, unfortunately, few devices reach that threshold, but then we can then slot the device into other categories depending on the amount of echo loss in each frequency band. So a natural progression from the mosquito buzz echo during uh, or the spectral 
echo test is to look at the double talk performance because here we are now looking at the amount of attenuation that occurs during double talk. And we're doing this on several degrees of double talk. We have what we call bargin. Sometimes we just call it segment one. And then we have sentence double talk or segment two. What's shown in the top right is bargin, segment one that consists of eight utterances. That is the word five, repeated eight times. And then segment two is the very last bit here where you have four Harvard sentences. Now, why we test for the attenuation during double talk is because if there's too much attenuation, then it severely degrades the conversational experience. So if we were on a regular phone call now in place of a webinar, you might be tempted to barge in or interrupt my speech because you want to contribute something to the conversation. And you might go, hey, Jacob, stop, wait, something. I want to barge in. But if your device, your echo cancer is performing in such a way that it that it attenuates the near-end speech too much, then I will never even perceive that you're trying to barge in, and I will never perceive that you're trying to get my attention, and I will continue with my monologue. That is for the moderate or mild type of double talk. We also include the assessment of the full-on double talk when people on both sides of the phone call are just speaking continuously. And that can get a little messy from a conversational standpoint, but it's certainly realistic. It happens. And if it happens, ideally, you want your device to still be able to transmit what the near end is saying, what you are saying to the far end without adding echo. So we want to test this element for both segment one, bargain and segment two. The way that we do the test is we have 25 seconds of activation. So it's not shown in the time domain here in the top right, but we have 25 seconds of just near end and far end speech, non overlapping. And then the first time we run through this stimulus file, we just have the near end single talk speech. That is the hat's mouth only saying eight utterances of five or eight instances of the word five and then four Harvard sentences. Then we measure the level versus time of that uplink signal. We keep that in mind as we run the test case again. We go through 25 seconds of activation, but now during these eight instances of the word five and the four Harvard sentences, we now have the device playing Harvard sentences throughout the entire thing. So we end up with varying degrees of double talk and overlap in the sentences. And now we measure what is the uplink signal when we have the double talk. We do a level versus time analysis of that signal and then we compare it with the single talk scenario. Basically, that would be the ideal case. Can the double talk measurement get as close as possible to the single talk test case? That's what we're looking for here. So. There is some subtraction and normalization and histogram analysis. Basically, what we end up with is a graph that looks a little bit like this. It is showing us the amount of attenuation that occurs for each utterance and each sentence relative to the single talk scenario. So this is a delta level versus time analysis. And if you look closely on the time domain analysis at the top, you'll see that for utterance number four and five, the green and the red, they overlap actually quite well, meaning the double talk performance is nearly as good as the single talk. So just visually, utterance four and five or instance four and five look pretty good. Now, if we go down here to our delta level versus time analysis, you can see likewise, there's not a whole lot of attenuation occurring here. So indeed, those two utterances actually come through almost entirely. So if you're trying to barge in and you say the word five, I would actually hear you say the word five. 
which is fantastic. On the other hand, if you look at, for instance, instance number seven and eight, there's not a whole lot being transmitted during double talk. In other words, your echo cancer is now severely reducing the signal that you are trying to send. So likewise, if we look at the delta level versus time analysis, we're not sending a whole lot. There's 30, maybe even 40 dB of attenuation occurring right here for these two utterances. So basically, I'm not going to hear you when, if we get this type of performance. Now, much like before, we also have a table from ITUT P340 where we can use the data that we get here and plot it on our chart. In this case, ideally, we don't really want to see more than 3 dB of echo loss in the delta level versus time analysis. We want to be within 3 dB of the single talk example. And if not 3, then 6, because then we're what we call partial duplex and a 2A. In this case, doing the analysis for this device gets us almost 20 do, 22 dB of attenuation. It puts us squarely in a type 3, no duplex, no bueno, not going to work. So we have some room for improvement. All right, so let's look at the multi-talker test because this is relatively new and it's pretty interesting and unique. A lot of these are grabbed from ITUT P340, the very new Annex B, which was just released here a couple months ago. And what it lists are four different test scenarios for evaluating the near-end switching characteristics. Those four tests are the adaptation time. We'll look at the level of overlapping speech. We'll look at dynamic turn-taking or switching characteristics. And then we'll do a similar spectral analysis using the mosquito buzz, the AM-FM signal. And there's actually a, a fifth scenario in here, and that is the speech quality analysis. That's what you guys know as 3Quest. So that is included in this as well. And with these different test scenarios, we have enough to really make a good determination whether the device will perform well in its intended uh, use case scenario. So if you look at the screenshot from Aqua and the HQS Smart Home Database, you'll see that we deliver all the test cases with both speech tests and CSS bursts. And one of the things that I would like to share with you now is based on our most recent work, we can confirm that using CSS bursts on most modern devices is not going to get you the same results as using speech. Basically, a lot of the devices don't handle CSS bursts as well as they do speech. And so if you're doing this stuff, we highly recommend that you use speech as your stimulus. The other thing you might notice is each of the test cases include both a static setup as well as a turntable supported setup. And that is because if we look in ITT P340, there is a table that includes all types of angles and setups that we can use to properly test this device. And so you can do it one by one, or if you have a turntable, you can bang through all 16 different setups pretty easily and pretty quickly. The whole point is, with this done, we have a lot more confidence that the device performs well with multi-talkers, concurrent talkers, dynamically switching talkers, basically everything you would see in a realistic scenario, whether that is more of a conferencing scenario or whether that is more of a leisurely uh, conversation in a home setting. So our test setup is now going to change ever so slightly. We still have our Aqua PC and our LabCorp front end, but now we have two head and torsos that are interacting acoustically with the device. And we have a turntable that can allow us to rotate the device. And if the diagrams aren't enough to illustrate the setup, we do have a little picture that shows roughly what it would look like in the real world. So let's look at the first test case. This is where we look at the adaptation time when we have alternating talkers. 
So all four of the following test cases are really just about evaluating how good the DUT handles multi-talkers. The adaptation time though is specifically about how quickly it takes for the device to normalize or asymptote towards a target line or a normalized level. The measurement process consists of using real speech utterances. So again, we revert to using the word five for each hats, hats A and hats B, in an alternating non-overlapping pattern shown in the top right. Those signals are then analyzed in a level versus time format, and we measure the level of each utterance, each instance of the word five. And then the idea is we want to display the data as shown in the bottom right, and then from the very first time, either hats, doesn't really matter which one, but let's just choose in red here, hats B. The first time hats B says the word five, we wanna make sure that we flatten out and we get to a target level within one adaptation period. And then we wanna stay within that plus minus one dB. So the real world application here is if you have two talkers in a room, and they're alternating their speech, we don't want the device to take 5, 10, 15, or 20 seconds before it's able to lock into talker number two and present the speech from talker number two at a reasonable level. We want this to happen within a single speech utterance. So we give you a grace period of one, and then if you don't get it, it is a fail. So this device happens to, to do that very well so maybe it doesn't illustrate a failure at all. An example of a failure would be, for instance, if we had hats B, the first time it spoke and said five, the device only picked up, let's say 10 dB less. So it's down somewhere around minus 23 dB. And then finally it starts to pick up the level and asymptote towards this target adaptation level. If it takes more than that one utterance, one period, then it's a fail. So the second test is then looking at the level of overlapping talkers. In this case, we have the measurement process is fairly similar in that we use the utterance five as um, some adaptation for the device. And then when we get to the measurement period here at the end, we have hats A say some Harvard sentences in a single talk scenario, followed by hats B in a single talk scenario, and then hats A and hats B at exactly the same time will repeat their Harvard sentences in a completely overlapping fashion. When we go to analyze the results, what we see is we would like for the level of talker A in the reference scenario, so the single talk scenario, we would like for that level plus the level of talker B in the single talk scenario to be equal to the level um, measured in segment C, which is the completely overlapping section. So the way that we do that is we basically assume that if we add A and B, we get the ideal or the air path total. And that total then needs to be, or rather the device's performance needs to be within plus minus one dB of that total. Otherwise, what it's indicating to us is the device is either favoring one or the other, it's uh, ignoring one or the other hats and only, uh, only sending the signal from one hats and not the other. So we really want the true total, the sum of the two, to be sent to the far end. So let's look at the dynamic turn taking. Again, the measurement process is similar to before, but now for the final analysis section, we have some partial overlapping and some non-overlapping transition. So 
after our adaptation using the utterance five, we have hats A speak out some Harvard sentences. Then we have hats B use some Harvard sentences. And then as hats B repeats, we have that overlap of hats A. So all of a sudden, the device under test has to figure out that now hats A is talking. I need to switch between the two because hats B also, you'll notice, will stop talking shortly after that. And then as soon as hats A is done talking, hats B will start talking immediately. So that is the non-overlap switching parameter we, that we want to look at. So the first one occurs here on the chart. The second one occurs here. When we look at the level versus time, we're actually analyzing two things here. We're analyzing the active speech level as well as the overall minimum that occurs within the reference section. So that is the exact same amount of time. I think it's one and a half seconds of this Harvard sentence compared to the one and a half sentence that occurs immediately after the partially overlapped switch. And we analyze the active speech level there as well as the minimum level in the level versus time domain. And then we do the same thing for hats B. The front end of this reference utterance we will analyze. And then likewise, just the front end of this reference, uh, this utterance back here immediately after. So this is the non-overlapped switch. And we want to compare the two. And what we want to see is a well-designed device hit no more than 3 dB difference in the active speech level and no more than a 6 dB minimum level difference in the segments that we analyzed and talked about. So the fourth one is then looking at the frequency domain. And this is going to be a little bit of an amalgamation of previous tests, but I think it'll make sense to you as we walk through it. We'll still use the utterance five as an adaptation for the device and a uh, conditioning, if you will, for the device. And then instead of Harvard sentences, now we have hats A, buzz, the, uh, the AM FM signal, and then in a single talk environment shown on the time domain graph. Then we'll have hats B in a single talk scenario, buzz a separate mosquito buzz signal. And then we'll have the complete overlap between A and B at the end. But remember, we're using slightly offset frequencies here. And allowing us to do those slightly offset frequencies means that we can distinguish between hats A and hats B when we analyze the scent or the uplink signal. And so what we do is we plot on a graph in solid blue lines, the reference condition for hats A, and then in dashed blue lines, we'll analyze the level of the overlapped hats A speech. Now, in this graph, it's hard to see because this particular device, you can see at the bottom, really there's no big difference. We've determined that plus minus 3 dB is the threshold for a well-designed device. This device handles both talker A and talker B well within plus minus 3 dB. There's maybe a slight difference right down at the lowest frequencies, but otherwise it looks stable and flat. So up here, it's hard to tell the difference. All right, so let's go to maybe something that's a little more familiar to us, and that is three quests or the speech quality evaluation using concurrent talkers. So in this case, uh, we have a couple different noise scenarios that we superimpose on our test setup. And then we analyze the speech quality. So that's SMOS, the noise suppression quality, that's NMOS and GMOS, the global or the overall MOS score for, for each of the hats. So we have an alternating test stimulus, hats A, hats B, hats A, hats B. And for three quests, you guys might be used to noise scenarios like crossroads or train noise or pub. Those aren't the noise scenarios that we have implemented for HQS Smart Home or in the three pass playback system. What we have now are noise scenarios like conference room, 
living room, bathroom, uh, kitchen. And especially the last three that I mentioned are relatively new. So if you're not familiar with them, the living room, for instance, then maybe has a slightly contrived example of living room noise sources, things like there's a vacuum cleaner going on for a little while, then a, a uh, music source or TV switches on for a little while. The bathroom one is interesting because it contains both electric shavers, there's a faucet going on, there's a toilet flushing and a, and a shower turning on at different intervals throughout the noise source. And it might make you think, what is the use case where you have a multi-talker scenario in a bathroom? And even though that might be a little silly or extreme, it's certainly something that we allow you to test so that you can validate a relatively extreme use case. Because the noises, frankly, are relatively disturbing and loud. And if we add the room acoustic simulation of a bathroom, those are typically very reflective surfaces. It makes for a very tricky environment when you're doing this type of tuning. So once we've done all of this and put all our pieces together, what we end up with is something that looks a little bit like this. We have our PC running Aqua as well as 3Pass. And Aqua, of course, controls our LabCorp front end, which interacts with both of the head and torsos in the room, as well as the device under test. We have 3Pass on the same PC controlling the LabBGN and the loudspeakers. And the issue that we have danced around a little bit here is the reverberation software, which lives inside of 3Pass. So we have something called 3Pass Reverb that allows you to add reverberation through the background noise speakers. And that could either be done as a standalone um, impairment or in addition to background noise playback. But we can add that to any of the sending direction tests so that the device under test really has to work as if it's in a real environment, be that a living room, a kitchen, or a bathroom. So the take home message that we want to leave you guys with is that through all of our research and play and discussions and analysis, what we put together in HQS Smart Home we feel is a very comprehensive test suite that allows you to analyze every element of the communication protocol that your device might encounter. So any single talk or test scenario that you can think of, we have tried to include here. We've covered the most advanced conversational metrics. And of course, we've included a lot of these multi-talker scenarios that definitely need to be validated before your device goes to market. If you take into account that we can then use different background noise scenarios, we can add room acoustic simulation, what you have at the end of this is confidence. You have confidence that your device goes to market having being tested with the most advanced tools available. And then, as you may have noticed, as a recent trend with head acoustics is we are adding a lot more automation features into our test suites and our databases. So we're getting awfully close to that uh, dream of hitting a button at Friday 5 p.m. showing up Monday morning and there you have all your data. So the tagline that we're using for a lot of this stuff is smart solutions help. And what we tried to do here is show you that there is a pretty sophisticated solution here that really could help your product tuning and product development needs. So by all means, reach out to your local Head Acoustics account manager and we will be happy to talk to you about what we could do and how we could help you make a better product. With that, I would like to thank you very much for your attendance and would like to wish you a wonderful day and I'm sure we'll be in touch soon. Thanks a lot. Bye.